Happy Sunday morning. It is May 17th. In the old days, in the good old days, when I was able to go by people's houses and make visits, I would ring the doorbell. And 90% of the time, this is what would happen. Either the doorbell wasn't working at all, and I would stand there knocking on the door, and then I would get my phone and call them and say, I'm here. Or, if the doorbell was working, the person was down the basement or otherwise occupied, and they didn't hear the doorbell. Revelation chapter 3 says, God stands at the door and he knocks. And when we let him in, then the blessing is quite significant. This is a Sunday morning. You are gathered for worship. Maybe you'll be looking at this on Monday or Wednesday or Thursday. But whenever you look at this service, you've asked God to come in and visit with you. And he has promised to give you his peace. Let me have a prayer with you. Lord, you are our everything, our strength, our song, our shield, our salvation. Come to us now, Lord, in this act of worship. For you have knocked and we have opened that door. May we not be distracted. May we not be distracted by something external or something internal, meaning our own fears. May we not be distracted as God and all of his power and all of his love come to us at this time. Bless this worship for your children. In our Savior's name, amen. Friends, I'm going to have you greet one another, which we normally do on a Sunday morning. Take that time momentarily to chat with each other. Let us know where you are and how many are worshiping with you. And after that period of chat has come to an end, I'm going to open in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we're going to sing our opening hymn, hymn 469. God bless your worship. Dear friends, would you join with me in the confession of sins? Our help is in the name of the Lord, 
who made heaven and earth. And if you, O Lord, kept a record of our sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore you are feared. We are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds, and that we cannot free ourselves from this sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism, you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, Lord, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Listen very carefully to the readings today, and uh, maybe do what I do as I look at these readings. I try and tie these readings, these promises of God, try and tie it in with the situation we're going through right now. And for this country and this world, it's the COVID virus. Listen carefully to God's presence in this psalm, Psalm 66, beginning at verse 8. Bless our God, O ye people. Let the sound of his praise be heard. God has kept our soul among the living and, and has not let our feet slip. You, O God, have put us to the test. You have tried us as silver is tried. You have brought us into a net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You, O oh God, have allowed men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you. That which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fattened animals with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come and hear then all you who fear God. And I will tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth. And high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and, and to, to the, the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was, was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and, and will be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, the New Testament lesson, again, listen carefully to this lesson because it ties in with our circumstance of today. First Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed by God. Do not fear what others fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart set apart Jesus as Lord. Be ready at every opportunity to give to anyone who asks the reason for the hope that is within you. Do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. 
Thus far the reading, this is the word of our Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Friends, the Holy Gospel for this Sunday, which is also the sermon text for the day, is found in John chapter 14. I'm going to begin reading at the 15th verse. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and my Father is in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Thus far the reading, this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, I'm going to invite you at this time to join with me in the Creed of the Apostles. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, but on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May this faith be your peace. Amen. At this time, we sing the hymn of the day. It is hymn 750, verses 1, 2, 3, and 7.
Good morning. I want to share with you during these moments we have together here from that gospel reading in John 14, beginning at verse 15. Dear friends in Christ, Derek Redmond was determined. He had to finish the race, period. He was a young British runner, and he became famous by shattering his country's 400-meter record on track at the age of 19. But then an Achilles tendon injury made him withdraw from the 1988 Summer Olympics in Seoul, South Korea. And he endured five separate surgeries to fix that particular problem. And when the Summer Olympics were going to come to Barcelona in 1992, Derek Regman, he was absolutely aching for a medal. But now he could do it in a healthy, confident way. On the day of the 400-meter track race, 65,000 fans streamed into the stadium, and they were anxious to witness one of sports' most thrilling events. And high up in the stands was Derek's father, Jim Redmond. He had faithfully witnessed every one of his son's world competitions. And according to the ESPN Sports Network that was covering that event that day, they said that Jim was wearing a t-shirt and it read, have you hugged your foot today? The race begins and Derek breaks through the pack to be in the lead. And his father, Jim, says to himself, keep it up, keep it up. And heading down the backstretch, only 175 meters from the finish line, Derek is in stride to win that particular race and to put him into the finals for the Olympics. But then Derek Here's a pop. It's his right hamstring. And he pulls up lame, looking as if he had been shot. His leg is quivering, and he begins to hop on the other leg, and then he finally slows down, and he falls to the track. Medical personnel run toward him as he's laying on the ground, holding that right hamstring. At the very same moment, there's a stir at the top of the stands. Jim Redmond, seeing his son in trouble, he begins to race down those steps and he sidesteps some of the people and bumps into others on the way. Jim has no right or credentials or permission to go onto the track, but all he can think about is getting to his son to help him get up. He's absolutely single-minded about that. And Jim, he's not going to be stopped by anyone. On the track, Derek realizes that his dream of an Olympic medal, that it's gone. He's alone. The other runners, they streak past him, and Steve Lewis of the United States is the one who eventually wins that race. Derek is orphaned in a figurative way, as a lonely figure on the track without parents or friends. He's alone, and tears pour down Derek's face, and all he can think of is that I don't want to be known as one who did not finish the race. Not finishing was not even part of his vocabulary. And he himself lifts himself up on his feet ever so slowly and carefully, and he starts hobbling down the track. And suddenly the crowd realizes that Derek isn't dropping out of the race. He isn't limping off the track in defeat. But he's actually continuing on one leg. And he's fiercely determined to make it to the finish line, one painful step at a time, each one slower and more agonizing than the step before. Derek limps onward, and the crowds, they begin to cheer him on. The fans rise to their feet, and their cries grow louder, and pretty soon there's a thunderous roar from the stadium. And at that moment, Jim Redman, his father, he reaches the bottom of the steps and the stands. He jumps over the rail and dodges a security guard and he runs out to his son. He's got two security people running after him now, pursuing him, and he yells back to that security crew, that's my son out there and I'm going to help him. Jim reaches his son at the final curve and about 120 meters from the finish line, he wraps around his arms around the waist of Derek. I'm here, son, 
Jim says gently, hugging his boy, we'll finish together. And Derek puts his arms around his father's shoulders and he sobs. And then arm in arm, father and son struggle toward the finish line with the 65,000 people cheering and clapping and even crying. I'm the proudest father alive, Jim Redmond said to the press afterwards with tears in his eyes. I'm prouder of him than I would have been had he won the gold medal. It took a lot of guts for him to do what he did. Together they had made a promise to finish the race, to finish the race no matter what. If you want to get some inspiration and encouragement from this particular event, I want you to go to YouTube, if you can, and search on Redmond and 1992 and Olympics. You'll see that moment from the time he's running through the time he's hurting and through the time that they finish and make it through. That true story leads me to speak here to you about the relationship that God has with us, to talk about God the Father and Son. Jesus says to his disciples on the night before his crucifixion, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. They were bound together as they approached the finish line, which would be at the cross, when Jesus would be able to say, it is finished. They would be bound as tightly as Derek and Jim Redman. The setting for this 14th chapter of John in that particular gospel, it's very important as we heard in our gospel reading today. And as we also heard in the reading from last week, the first 14 verses of John 14. It's a chapter of encouragement for the disciples. Jesus is in the upper room on Monday, Thursday, and it's hours before he's going to be betrayed. He's with his disciples in a very private moment because in a short time, that next day, Jesus is going to be publicly put to death on the cross for the sins of all people of all time. We find in these words of Jesus great comfort and encouragement as Jesus says to them, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. And another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. Now some translations call the word advocate counselor, but both terms, they refer to the Holy Spirit. The disciples, they would need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as they would face those hours and days ahead when Jesus would be taken from them. They would wonder why. Now, the disciples, they already had the Spirit in them. But the Lord says that he's going to send the Spirit in an even greater measure to them. And we know, too, that in 50 days from the resurrection, on that day of Pentecost, they would get the full power of the Holy Spirit. Make no mistake when Jesus describes that he will give you another counselor, another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. And as you hear those words, you may remember when Pontius Pilate had taken Jesus and placed him before him, and Pilate says to Jesus, what is truth? You're talking about truth, what is truth? As Pilate represents the world, he reminds Jesus that Pilate, he puts no stock in the truth. And we know, too, that it's the same with the world today. Jesus said then, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And that spirit of truth, that spirit was made alive and well and living in the disciples. And by grace, they knew the promises of God. By grace, they had seen Jesus make promises time and again and then fulfill them. By grace, Jesus had made them fishers of men, taking them away from their vocations as being fishermen. Jesus would take Matthew, who was known as Levi, a tax collector, and he would turn him into a soul collector by grace. And because they had seen all these things and they had experienced them, the disciples' reaction was to love the Lord because of the Lord's fulfilled promises to them. 
Jesus says to them, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now that statement probably didn't mean much to them as they're sitting there just after celebrating the Last Supper. And it probably wasn't going to mean much to them or them thinking of that time when Jesus has said that he would be put to death and he would be laid to rest in a tomb. But on that Good Friday, the disciples probably thought about that statement when Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. Jesus was reminding them that they were God's very own children. The disciples would not be forgotten. They would not be forsaken. Instead, the disciples, they would be forgiven. Again, their reaction as being God's children was to love the Lord. Jesus says, he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Time and again, the Lord had revealed himself to his disciples. Time and again, the Lord, he would try to get the disciples to understand that he was God's son. So Jesus states here, as you love me, you love the Father and the Father loves you. And now as all the disciples knew God's promises by grace, they were moved to love the Lord. Even though you and I are separated because of the conditions due to the COVID-19 virus, that is why you and I are gathered here today to worship, as you do through video, or as you listen by calling our toll-free number. It's simply and purely by God's grace that we are God's children. For when we were born into this world, we were born actually enemies of God. But the Lord changes all of that because you and I know that we can't do anything to change that sinful nature by ourselves. The Lord does it for us, and the Lord does it to us. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in the fourth chapter, He talks about the fact that the great creator of the heavens and the earth is the same God who takes time out to change our lives. Paul writes, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. This is the same God who made the heavens and the earth We know that as we can look back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. This is the same God that has power to change our hearts, hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. And by grace, we are made believers. By grace, we come to know the promises of God and we begin to love as we live as his children. So let's review it in this way. The disciples, they're called to get into the action, to run the race, if we were to use that term. But Jesus is there with them. They could have never done this without him. And in their faith run, they've never been alone. Jesus has always been there. His physical presence has been their continued reassurance. The miracles of Jesus, the teaching, the leadership— It's been enough to keep them going. But now he's going to be going away. The unthinkable is now happening. How are they going to proceed? Well, some of the disciples, perhaps they're already possibly thinking about talking to their fishing buddies and seeing if they might be able to get a job in a fish cannery, perhaps in Capernaum. But Jesus says that even after his death, he will still be with them. He will encourage them. He will lead them. He'll pray for them to his Father. And he will teach them. But the nature of his presence will change. Jesus says, in a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Jesus will be with them for 40 days after his resurrection. And he'll soon be present to them in the form of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit fills them on that day of Pentecost. And the Spirit is even with them on that first day of resurrection 
when Jesus breathes on them the Holy Spirit. And one day, they will see Jesus when they see him in heaven's glory. They will not run the race alone. They will not cross the finish line alone. You and I, you know, we've all been in circumstances where we've perhaps signed on to something and doing it knowing that we were going to have the help of someone who's going to be there with us. And if we were to do that alone, we might say, forget it. Well, that's the key issue here. The disciples, they had signed on because Jesus was their team leader. He chose each of them. We signed on because we believed in him. That faith that the Spirit created in us, we know that we were chosen by God to be his children. He would be present in our lives. He would be the God who's trustworthy, the God who was someone that we could count on for whatever we needed. And then maybe things happen that suggest that God is not with us, that Jesus has indeed left us orphaned. And that word orphaned, it's a strong image. It's a feeling that your own parents have rejected and abandoned you. Or perhaps it's that your parents are not present because of a tragedy. You don't have even your closest blood relatives to support and encourage you. You are orphaned. Jesus told his disciples that he would not leave them orphaned. That is, without a parent being present in their lives. In his book, A Rumor of Angels, Modern Society and the Rediscovery of the Supernatural, written in 1997, excuse me, 1970. Sociologist Peter Berger tells of a priest who's working in the slums of a European city. And someone comes up and asks the priest, why do you do it? And his answer was, so that the rumor of God may not disappear completely. Here's the question. How are we going to react when the rumor of God is fading? when we pull up with a hamstring, when we have no one who comes down from the stands to help us, to put their arms around us, are we alone? We know the answer is no. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of life. Jesus promises his followers, because I live, you also will live. The good news is that Jesus has conquered the power of sin and death. And the same God who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to our bodies through the spirit that dwells in us. And no matter what tragedies may face us, the ones that come our way, whether they're academic, vocational, medical, or emotional, we can hold tight to the promise that Jesus gives us the gift of life. Life in this world and also in the world to come. Martin Luther's small catechism of 1529 has been the main source of instruction in the Lutheran Christian faith for almost 500 years. There is another catechism called the Heidelberg Catechism, a Reformed Protestant teaching tool that was written in 1562. And that particular catechism asks as its first question, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer there is as true today as it was almost 500 years ago. The answer is that I belong, body and soul, in life and death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. We belong to Christ, and it's his spirit that gives us life. And that's good news for any of us who find ourselves limping toward the finish line. The Holy Spirit, he's also the spirit of love. And Jesus says to his disciples, those who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me are loved by the Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The love between God and Jesus is never limited to a supernatural father-son relationship, but we know that it spills into our lives. And it saturates us with unconditional acceptance and affection and acknowledgement. 
Of course, there are strings attached. Jesus does talk about obedience. His words are, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And for us, sometimes that can be demanding. It can be difficult. It can even be overwhelming. The important thing to keep in mind is that the commands of Jesus, they all involve living a life of love. In a chapter earlier, in John 13, Jesus says to his disciples, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. When you're feeling defeated, love one another. When a medical test comes back, which is news that's disturbing, love one another. When a family member is facing a layoff, especially during these times right now, love one another. When there is a death in the community, love one another. When a friend is feeling rejected, or those who are feeling isolated during these times and alone, love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, says Jesus, if you have love for one another. The spirit of truth, he's the one who leads us into a life of love. A life of love with him, comforting us and carrying us through anything that life throws at us. And Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, he's the one who tells us in every place and in every time and in every situation, I'm here. We're never going to be separated again. We're in this to the finish forever. Please pray with me. Gracious God, at this time, it's a time when we can feel orphaned, isolated, alone, as we're, we're separated from others. And we thank you for these times that we have, that we can gather as we do even now to, to worship together as one family in Christ. Lord, we ask you to be with those who are going through the, the extreme measures of that loneliness and isolation. Be with those who are in nursing homes and other facilities where family members cannot even get through the door. Be with the ones who face complications from this virus, who are lying in hospital beds, in intensive care units, and even those who are facing ventilators to help them in their breathing. Lord, as they know and they trust in you, they know that they're not alone. And may you just in a special way give your presence to them, your love, put your arms around not just their waist, but their whole body, Lord, and, and, and keep them lifted up. Be with us. Be with all those who are, are helping in whatever way we can to be able to let them know that we are together and you are with us and you will never leave us nor forsake us. As you said to us, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age, and that's a promise. And we know you never break your promises. So bless us in these days, Lord, and may we go forward sharing that light with others who don't even know you and let them know that they are not alone as well. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. The Dead Sea is a very famous body of water on planet Earth. It's there in Palestine. They sit and think that in another 20 years, the Dead Sea will no longer exist. And the reason it will no longer exist is because it takes in, but it never gives out. And eventually, it will dry up and die. So it is for human lives. If all we do is take in, if we receive blessings from our family, if we receive blessings from our friends, and let's lift our eyes a whole lot higher, if we receive blessings from God... If all we do is receive, 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 and we never give out, we begin to die inside. Because that part of us 
that is made in the image of God, that part of us, it has to give out. And if that part of us made in the image of God does not give out, then we die. And how do we give out to God? We give out to him in our prayers. How do we give out to God? Acts of kindness bestowed upon others, the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, those in prison, those who are sick, and you and I go to them. How do we give out to God? By looking at that paycheck, if we are still so blessed to be getting one, by looking at that paycheck and saying to God, yours, yours, God, thank you for allowing me to have this. That's how you give out in your prayers by your acts of kindness and by the offerings of time, treasure, and talent given to God. Let me have a prayer with you. Heavenly Father, the offerings to our Lord have remained in my eyes as astonishing as last fall during our capital campaign. It speaks well of God's Spirit descending upon Trinity Congregation, this church, and this school. And it speaks well of the hearts of your people, understanding that everything they have has come from God, that in the midst of this virus, he has not left us and gone on vacation. He's with us as strongly as ever. And Lord, you have moved the hearts of your people to be generous in their giving of offerings for the sake of the work of the kingdom. Bless us, Lord, that we might be this blessing to others in our Savior's name. Amen. Let me have a prayer with you. Lord, so much has changed. I didn't have my graduation at the university. I didn't have my graduation at the high school. I didn't have any closure at the end of the school year. So much has changed, Lord. Normally I would get up at 6 a.m. in the morning and I'd be on my way to work. But that place of employment is shuttered for the time being. So much has changed, Lord. On the negative side, there are things that disturb me deeply, that make it difficult for me to sleep, and during the daylight hours, difficult for me to focus on anything but that thing that just fuels the fires of worry. On the plus side, I see you, Lord, even as this thief on the cross saw you in the midst of his death on Mount Calvary, even as the centurion saw you and ended up declaring, truly this is the Son of God, I see you, Lord, in the midst of this great circumstance, this once-in-a-century circumstance. I see you, Lord, because I still wake up of a morning and though it might take me a while to get there, I will end up saying, God, you've got this. The Lord is my shepherd. This is the day that God has made. And if I can say those things and believe them in my heart, then peace returns to me. And with the peace returning, there comes a strength and there comes a joy because there is God. Heavenly Father, Deuteronomy 30 says, God is not so far away from us that we have to send someone up to heaven to get him. He's not so far away that we have to send someone across the ocean to get him. He's very near us. He's in our mind and in our hearts that we might know him and that we might know his peace. He is not very far from any one of us. Lord, I ask that you be with Al Willie as he has treatments now for cancer. I ask that you be with Hank Biersma, who is critically ill. And I ask you to be with Mary Compton 
as she too has treatments for her cancer. Lord, I ask you to be with anyone who is observing this service at this time. Anyone who has a blessing they want to lift up to you, the baby came. The wedding happens. He gave me the ring. I'm going to set a date on the calendar. Good things still happen, Lord, in our personal lives and the lives of people in this country as we reach out continually with acts of kindness in the midst of this circumstance. Be with your children, Lord. Never a moment for any of us that we do not realize your presence, your peace, and your strength. In the name of him who has taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On this day and all the days that God gives us by his grace, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, grant you all of his blessing and all of his peace. Amen. Friends, the closing hymn is hymn 803.